Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this Pest Extra live presentation. We have Dr. Poppy Wild from the Birmingham School of Media to talk to you today about the uberfication of pest control and keeping up without cashing out. Just before we get started with the presentation, I've got a bit of housekeeping for you. Um, in terms of so questions and answers, hopefully lots of you have got lots of questions for Poppy at the end. You'll see a Q&A button where you can submit your questions. Really important that you use this Q&A button for questions. Now, if you've got general comments to make or a bit of uh, discussion that you want to have with any other attendees or the presenter or myself, then use the discussion forum for this. You said you should see a button there that says discussion forum. OK, keep those two separate there. Um, if you have any technical problems, sound, video, things like that, then you'll be able to see a live support button at the top of your screen or the side of your screen, depending on what device you've got. It should be the color orange saying live support. So any technical issues, then please do use that. Um, in the live sessions, we can't see or hear you. So uh, if you do want to have any live chats, then um, you can do this with the BBCA team and our exhibitors on their stands. Really want to make, you know, that is really important here. You know, we haven't got any traffic to worry about, have we? We haven't got to, you know, get home quickly to miss that rush hour traffic. So, you know, once uh, these presentations are, are, are done, please go and see our exhibitors and have a chat to them. Uh, I'll remind you again a bit later on. OK. Good stuff. Right. Without further ado, Poppy, please. That's um, uberfication of pest control. Let's, let's do it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nat. And thank you to the BPCA for having me today. Um, as Nat said, I am um, in the Birmingham School of Media at Birmingham City University. And I mainly um, teach around digital cultures, social media, digital media, new media. Um, so hopefully I am um, well equipped to talk to you today about the uberfication of pest control. So to start off, what is uberfication? Um, you, you may already have some ideas. I assume that many people will uh, think that it's linked to uber in some way. But what does that really mean in practice? There's a variety of different attributes and um, the list that I've got here isn't exhaustive, but a few key things. A lot of it is about privatization of different markets and bringing them off uh, from the public domain and uh, kind of sequestering money in specific ways. It's also a lot about deregulation because the way in which uberfication works is actually taking things out of the usual market economy, marketplace um, that we would usually expect to find them in. And so one of the dangers of uberfication is that with this privatization, there is also um, this kind of deregulation that it's kind of operating slightly outside of the norms of how we would usually expect um, the market to work, as I say. And in doing so, what uberfication is doing is creating workers who are constantly having to be micro entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs of your own business is one thing, but being a micro entrepreneur is more about being um, a, just a, a very small cog in a big machine. And so having to think about your actions in an entrepreneurial way, which is quite different from working in the, the open marketplace. So uberfication is about on-demand services. In this way, it's very disruptive, again, to the status quo, as I've alluded to. But its main tenor, its main uh, point of interest and allure, so particularly um, for, for consumers, is convenience. And this is where um, the, the whole kind of aspect of what uberfication is really about comes in. Uberfication is about making convenience into a commodity, as I'll come on to shortly. And so Fourth Source, all the way back in 2014, said that uberfication was technology that buys you time and saves you effort. So we can see the, the different aspects of how uberfication kind of draws on being convenient for consumers, but disruptive in many other ways through some of these different attributes that we just talked about. So we've got that on-demand service, so 
with Uber, obviously on demand when people want a taxi, when they want a car ride, um, it's there ready and waiting for them. Competitive prices, obviously when Uber first started out as a business model, it was about um, lowering potential bids. So the, the, the service providers pitching their service at a lower competitive rate. Another big thing of Uberfication is simplified processes. It's about providing that one-stop place for you to go when you need that particular service. And part of that is that it's very much linked to technological development. As I said, privatization and deregulation as well. So for the customer, these things um, all spell convenience. On-demand service, it's on the customer's time, not on the workers. It's cheap. The fact of the simplified processes means there's less processes to learn. If you think about the way a lot of different apps work at the moment, um, we understand how to use them. We understand that they operate in very formulaic ways. In the same way that we understand how websites work, for example, um, you can visit loads of different websites, but you can usually navigate your way around. You can usually understand your way around because you've got that understanding of how a website looks. It's the same with an app. Um, and that, as I say, is linked to that technological development. All about, again, that smartphone access that's enabling that convenience where we can tap into that as and when we want just at the, at the tap of a button. Uh, as I say, competition drives innovation. So this can be very handy for the uh, for the user, sorry. Um, it can mean that their processes, their procedures, the services that they are accessing are continually um, kind of trying to get better, faster, quicker, cheaper, whatever that mean uh, may mean. And we can see that how Uber, for example, moved into Uber Eats for, as, as an option there of how you can see that that, that kind of service provider um, is then capitalizing on what they've got and trying to innovate. And again, that means that, that if you continue to use Uber Eats, you're very used to the, the layout, the apps, the way that things look and how you go about using it. So they all feed into uh, each other. And then in terms of deregulation, there is little immediate or obvious effect on the end user until things go wrong. But it's a very different story for our service providers. On the one hand, the on-demand services means that you've got a disruption in traditional working hours. The competitive prices often lead to a drop in pay. And the simplified processes that are so good for customers mean that if you aren't in those places, if you aren't part of those simplified processes, and if you aren't in the right apps uh, or directories, for example, then you will be overlooked. This idea of technological development also means that for the, uh, for the provider, you are in always on work mode, which again links back to that on-demand service. It's very difficult to um, continue to make a profit by um, selecting the hours that you want to work without having any flexibility when the whole model is moving towards that flexibility and it being, as I say, on the customer's time rather than on the worker's. Of course, where that competition drives innovation, it's very hard to then, um, as, the, as the worker, innovate at all. So where Uber is innovating and expanding into Uber Eats, as a worker, it's very difficult for you to stand out um, and very difficult for you to detach yourself from the, the service provider that you are working with if you are. But it's also difficult to compete if you're not working with them because it's it becomes the go to again, you know, Uber becoming the go to um, place for for uh, car sharing, uh, sorry, car um, services. And then, of course, deregulation. We have got there the threat to statutory worker rights. And again, um, for those of you who are aware of Uber, you'll know that when Uber kind of um, after it had been knocking around for a few years, um, there was a lot, uh, a lot of, of difficulties with regards to exploitation of workers, them not getting proper statutory working rights. Um, 
often not actually receiving minimum um, pay, as well as obviously impacts on things like sick pay, holiday pay, etc. Now, with Uber, that has obviously changed uh, in more recent years. So due to the kind of pushback against these issues, but these are some of the things that we're facing. We've got these attributes of what Uberfication is and how that works for the customer. But as a service provider, the way that that might be quite disruptive to you. So trades are becoming increasingly commodi commodified, sorry, um, leaving them open to Uberfication. So you can see here um, that this is a, a list from Digital Wellbeing on the uberfication of everything, a directory master list. You can see here we've got, um, and it is worth pointing out that this is American, so that's why you've got the Uber for cannabis delivery, for example, there. Uber for odd jobs, hotel rooms, car repairs. And so these trades are becoming commoditized, leaving them open, as I say, to this uberfication of making them more simplistic, of making them more convenient, and of being able to kind of cash in on delivering those services to you. So what I've also done here is chosen a particular one of these to look through further. So as I say, you can see that all of these different sites are basically about linking a user with the service they want with minimal effort on the part of the user. It's not about minimal effort on the part of the worker, although many uh, kind of Uber-esque sites will try and convey it that way, but it's really about delivering that convenience to the worker. So you can see here in the middle there, we've got Uber for lawn mowing. So if we have a look at an example um, of an Uberfied service, so we've taken lawn mowing services, and then we're making that into a convenient way, a convenient app website, where our users can access that um, information and access that service. Now, this is Lawn Starter, again, an American site. Um, but worth pointing out that, again, one of the issues with the Uberfication model is that it works on the basis of using the products and equipment of the workers themselves. So in the same way as pest controllers, you will have a wide variety of equipment that you use that you've invested a lot of money in. Uh, similarly, obviously, um, lawn mowing being um, having a lot of equipment to go with that, things that have a hefty upfront cost. And rather than lawn starter paying for those, it's the workers who have paid for those, which is exactly the same as what, uh, again, initially happened with Uber. It was a case of you using your own car um, and and your, you kind of footing the bill of the toll that your work um, took on your equipment and the degradation of that. So if we look at Lawn Starter here, if we look at their, their first uh, homepage, you can see that we're immediately being guided to why a user would want to engage in this service. It's affordable and we've got that pointed out to us several times straight away. It's also quick. And again, this is pointing out that people want convenience. And then again, that is pointed out to us with it being fast there and getting an instant price over in the top right hand corner. But we've and we've also got it being easy. Great. Again, going in for that convenience. We don't have to put much effort in. So I feel immediately reassured that it's going to be nice and easy. And my satisfaction is going to be guaranteed. Fantastic. But it's also at the click of a button, which is, as I said before, not only part of the speed of it, but the fact of it being conveniently linked to those technological developments with that online ordering. So as we go through and have a look at Lawn Starter, you can see again, this is how it's being sold to the user. Five minute setup, you've got your online account management, everything done through an app. So again, nice and convenient. All services are covered. So I don't have to look elsewhere for someone else to do my fertilization or someone else to do my bush trimming uh, or neatening up the edges of my borders. All of those services are covered. 
The other important aspect, so there we've got, you know, it's quick, it's managed by apps, and it's all services in one place. And then what you've got here on that bottom row is about trust, trust, trust. Fully insured professionals, quality guaranteed, and hundreds of raving reviews. Don't take our word for it, read our five-star reviews on Google and Shopper Approved. So as I say, that last, that bottom row is all about not only are we making this convenient for you in terms of it being quick and easy, you can trust us. You don't need to worry about whether you're hiring the right person because we are doing that vetting process for you, which again, takes time and takes effort. So having someone else do that for us is a big bonus. And again, this is part of the Uberfication model. Now, what you might also have noticed is in the bottom right hand corner, um, whilst I've been talking, you've been seeing these different pop ups of who has been booking, where they're from, um, where, and, and how, how they booked and what they booked as well. So this is a, a kind of live view of the site, um, which I recorded a couple of days ago. And so as soon as you are there on that site, you've got this 616 people have signed up in the last 24 hours. And then you've got immediate real people, supposedly, um, real names, real locations, real bookings. And so you're constantly being reassured while you're there of the the again, the, the trustworthiness, other people are using this, so you can too. Now, the reason that all of these points here of this trust, of these reviews, of all of this kind of human proof going on in the bottom corner there of people booking, the reason that that is so important is because of the advertising saturation that we face in today's climate. Now, according to PPC Protect, although there are no official figures, the average person is now estimated to encounter between 6,000 to 10,000 ads every single day. And essentially what this means is that we, we become um, either oblivious of them um, or sceptical of them. And you can see here from the American Association of Advertising Agencies, that we can see how that, uh, that kind of skepticism runs deep. And this also depends on where you're looking at an advert. So 46% of people trust uh, in, in the survey, trusted an advert that was on television, moving down to 25% of people who trusted an advert in a newspaper to just 13% of people trusting an advert on social media or 9% of people trusting uh, a, a website banner, pop-up ad banner. And 29% of people do not find any advertising trustworthy whatsoever. So how do we combat that? this? And that is through that, again, that human contact and that human proof. The most important form of advertising today is recommendation from another person just like me. And this is what we call social proof. So again, some statistics here, where 90% more people are, are likely, no, sorry, people are 90% more likely to trust and buy from a brand recommended by a friend and word of mouth impressions result in five times more sales than a paid media impression. Now, this is what this, that kind of um, initial look at the bottom there of the lawn starter site is trying to demonstrate why can you trust us? Why should you listen to our advert? We've got hundreds of raving reviews. We've also done the checking out service for you. And you can watch in the bottom corner as more and more people book this service. So for you as someone who's trying to compete in this market as a pest controller, this is what you need to be bearing in mind in terms of the change of focus, in terms of how we get people involved and get people on board with our brands and business. Thinking about things like reviews, TripAdvisor, Amazon, badges, certifications, trusted logos, 
celebrity endorsements. If you've been doing pest control for any celebrities, ask them to send a tweet for you. Count of social media likes and shares and case studies. So you can see here, um, we've got a four day email uh, course on word of mouth marketing. And that is our social proof there. More than 6,000 people have already subscribed to it. So being aware of this aspect of how that those technological developments are changing the way in which people trust um, different businesses, different services online. Now, as I said earlier, this convenience culture, this desire to have things easy, as it were, leads to commodification, which leads to uberfication. So convenience culture does what it says on the tin. It is about delivering things to you quickly and easily and conveniently. And as I said, it is, it is linked to the technology that makes that convenience palpable. There's an app for everything now. And these online options are um, integrated carefully in terms of what we, what we want and how we understand we can get it. These, uh, this kind of aspect of um, these, these uberfication sites, these middlemen, men, if you will, um, are perceived to save time. People want something swiftly and easily without having to put in their own time and effort. So again, with Lawn Starter, you can see it's exactly that. It's saying, if you want a service, we have done the vetting process. We have found the people near you who can provide this service. We have checked them all out. We guarantee that it's going to be sorted and fine and easy and okay. And we guarantee that you're going to get a good affordable price. And it's as simple as that. It's also perceived to save money, but it's worth pointing out that Initially, it wasn't actually about saving money. It was about saving time and effort. So it's not necessarily just about um, cost. What leads it to being about cost is because as the service providers in that particular area grow or on that particular site grow, that is where that competition comes in, which leads to those competitive prices and always having to, to kind of go down. So people increasingly prefer to choose convenience over personal research. So they are, they are happy to let Lawn Starter do the work for them. And this becomes an opportunity for the intermediaries such as Lawn Starter, who will do the hard work for the customer, who will do all of that work for them. And so intermediaries have commodified the idea of convenience. And again, you can see that in terms of how those sites are pushing through this idea of things being quick, easy, minimal effort um, and maximum convenience. So the way that they do this is that they enable us to trust the intermediary, to trust the technology and to trust the verification processes. If we think about, um, as I mentioned before, PayPal and uh, the PayPal tick, we know we can trust PayPal, so we don't have to trust um, independent uh, payment systems or independent um, providers. We're able to go through PayPal and understand that they are doing the work of keeping us safe. We also trust the technology because we trust the convenience that it will bring us, because, of course, that is what apps are created for. And we therefore trust the intermediary. We are handing over our trust to them. Uh, we trust Uber to find us a verifiable, um, safe, adequately um, trained um, driver to get us from A to B. And we also understand that we can trust them because of the, uh, the, the guarantees that they make us and the ways in which complaints procedures are kind of, again, very formulaic and dealt with very swiftly. So again, these are the kinds of things that you need to be aware of that consumers are now really focused on in terms of their desire for what they want. Often trusting these larger corporations is uh, the trust in them is greater 
than more local ones. So for example, trusting Uber verification, more than the local lo council license granted to private car drivers. Now, sometimes that trust may be misplaced, but sometimes that trust is based on the fact that um, these larger corporations are potentially made held more accountable, uh, potentially that because they are operating on a larger scale, we can understand that their standardization processes might be stricter. So there's a variety of different aspects there that lead into what the um, what the service provider um, is, is kind of trying to capitalize on. They're using their big brand and their big name as an opportunity again to lure you in. The problem with intermediaries is this, workers become faceless and differences become meaningless. Now, of course, there are a variety of other problems with intermediaries, uh, not least um, the fact that their workers are exploited so much and so often. But that is because, as I say, the workers become meaningless, uh, become faceless. You don't have a relationship one to one with a service provider um, who you trust, you build a rapport with, you build a relationship with. Instead, any driver will do, any lawnmower will do, any pest controller will do. Now, that obviously for many people um, will impact on a variety of different ways. That might impact on job satisfaction, that might impact on um, issues of, of kind of feeling uh, important. And that might also impact on one's own self-value and self-worth when understanding the vast amount of training um, and work that has got into being where you are and who you are as a service provider. Differences become meaningless in that there is no difference in terms of who drives me from A to B if I'm getting them through Uber as long as they do it quickly and conveniently. So the luxury of the car might be an added extra, but it's not something that I'm really looking for. It's not really something that I'm, I'm actually seeking out actively. In the same way as, you know, the quality of how my lawn is being mown uh, may not be what I'm looking for, I'm just looking for that quick and easy, convenient solution. And so what you as a service provider, as a pest controller are able to offer becomes something that often to the consumer is meaningless because potentially they don't know about it, but also they don't necessarily know that they should know about it because they don't have that individual, as I say, relationship and rapport that is built with you. Everything is done through the intermediary. Um, it's all done at someone else's uh, convenience. And so there aren't necessarily the same op opportunities and options for communication. So this means that when you're working for an intermediary, you have to be aware again um, of, of the impacts that that might have on you or on your business model and on what you want to get out of, um, of what you're, you're putting in. So if we were to see a model where pest control becomes uberfied, gets taken over by an intermediary who matches a service provider with a customer, where would that be most likely to come from? There's a few different possibilities. One is Amazon Home Services. So Amazon Home Services, as you can see, they're immediately selling themselves in terms of them tackling our to-do list. Sounds great transparent pri pricing, easy scheduling, and happiness guarantee. So again, we've got this aspect of having it convenient for us. Um, it's our preferred times. It, it's at our whim. We're going to be satisfied with it, same as we would be with Lawn Starter. Uh, the pricing is nice and clear for us to see. So we know that we're not going to have a service provider turn up at our house and then change their mind, say, oh, no, it's going to be a bit more than that. So again, we don't have to do any of that haggling, any of that stress or tension, gone. Amazon has taken that for us. And Although they don't yet have, uh, so Amazon Home Services in America are launched up and running. And although they don't yet have this 
for pest control services, the page is there. The page is in existence. It's not populated and it's not easily accessible through the Amazon drop down menu, but it exists. So this is obviously something that Amazon Home Services in America are already considering offering and moving into. Obviously, um, benefits of uh, Amazon is everyone uses Amazon, right? Most people have an Amazon app or several. Um, we've got um, it has a very powerful review system. They have got loads of money. We are used to having convenience delivered to us from Amazon. Um, and um, it, it, it again, it, it's, it's trusted. It's already part of our kind of day-to-day -day, uh, way of, of kind of shopping, living, ordering things, etc. cetera. Uh, another option might be Google. So Google's local ad services. Um, you can see, again, this is um, helping you connect, book local jobs and grow your business is the way that this is being sold to the service provider. So uh, local service ads help you connect with people who search on Google for the services that you offer um, and your ads will show up for customers in your area. And you've got the Google guarantee. You can earn the trust of new customers as a Google guaranteed provider. Now, again, most people use Google as their search engine. Um, Google know how to make consumers click adverts. We already have that. We know that they are very good at what they do. And it's designed to make you choose their advert over your website. So um, Google is looking to, to benefit themselves. Then we've got things like which uh, trusted traders, where we can think about how these directory services are already starting to expand what they are offering and what they do for um, their customers, rather than um, just having uh, those that, that kind of directory service. They're interested in how they can move into making money by linking people together in these more convenient ways, understanding that convenience is the way to earning big money for them because they can just take a little bit off the top at all stages and that at minimum effort to them, especially with these directory services, which again are, are already being used by service providers and customers alike. And then we've got uh, Facebook, who are also in America. They've already rolled out their home service professionals. Um, so building on the way in which they have used um, Marketplace to kind of uh, get in on the auction site um, area. You know, we've seen how Facebook Marketplace has kind of uh, taken a lot of business away from eBay, for example. So in America, this has become... Um, kind of developed further into finding home service professionals. Um, and again, you can see how this is, is um, pros are verified. We've got those um, top rated professionals. We've got it simple, nice and easy. Again, loads of people already have Facebook. And this uh, text on the right hand side is from the Facebook page about this update, um, which was made to the American site in 2018, as I say. And then we've also got it being someone else entirely. So this model already exists, okay? So it could come from anyone. So what can you do? This is the really important question. You can join them and you can have many benefits of that. You have flexibility. You don't have to necessarily uh, work nine to five. You might decide that you're going to offer your hours, um, your services at different hours. So you might be able to benefit from the flexibility that these these services uh, offer. You can get leads on sources, and and again, this is the way it's being sold to you. And there are forms of verification that are achievable. Those things like the Google guarantee, for example. Um, they are achievable ways of getting that verification tick and making yourself stand out as someone trusted. You've also got the potential to use this as an opportunity to build your client base and your brand for 
if you do want to leave in the future now obviously we talked about the difficulties of that especially in this kind of faceless worker community but it is a possibility and some people do make some money this way okay people who um, are working for these kind of uberfied services are making money but you need to be cautious of these situations and of the different um, options that they are offering you remember the intermediaries are not your friends. You are a commodity to them and they are interested in making money off you. They have the power and that also means that they have the power to change the parameters of how you are expected to work. It isn't signing a contract and um, things being in, in quite a stable position. They have the parameters to move um, they have the power to move those parameters at will. And what's really important is that those changes often come very quickly because they are responding to audience and customer needs. So that often happens very quickly with little notice. Be aware of what the cost to you is. How much are they taking? How much are you paying them? Make sure that you are tracking that and that you're happy with what you're getting in return. And use that data, use your understanding of knowing when to buy in, when to stay where you are, when to capitalize on the opportunities you've got, and when it's time to jump ship. Remember that the more power you give them, the more power they build, and be aware of others in the same position. Consider the benefits of potential unions. And again, this is how a lot of the worker industries that work on this model um, have managed to kind of secure better working rights um, for um, the, the people who, who work for them. Or you can beat them. Now, beating them means building off these kinds of facts. 88% of consumers placed the highest level of trust in word of mouth recommendations from people they know. Brands that inspire a higher emotional intensity receive three times as much word of mouth as less emotionally connected brands. So a little checklist of how you might think about beating them. Be more human. Build word of mouth by selling what Amazon or Google or Facebook can't. Your personality. Be you and make that part of the commodity that you are selling. Be more trusted. Build on that desire for social proof and trust. Make it obvious that you are as trusted, whether you've got the Google guarantee or not, that you are as trustworthy. Ask for reviews. Ask for testimonials build up that social proof. Be seen and be around in your local area where you want people to employ you. And be more visible when people don't have a pest problem so that you are remembered when they do. Now, you might say, well, how do I do that? That links into this idea of being more useful as well. Why would people visit your website or your social media when they don't have a pest problem? Be more useful. Think about what you are sharing. Share your expertise. Be generous with what you know. Think about how you can create an environment where people are following you, as I say, even when they don't have a pest problem, so that they know to go to you when they do. Also, remember that you aren't just delivering uh, something through Uber Eats or Just Eat. You are, um, you know, providing an expert service. Elevate yourself. Allow that to be seen. Recognize it in yourself and ensure that your customers recognize it in you too. But do remember that you need to try and be convenient too. Provide an easy alternative and make it easy for people to find you so that they don't have to go to these other places. Thank you so much. I hope that's been useful for you. And uh, if we've got uh, any time for any questions then I would be happy to take them fantastic thank you Poppy that was great that was great well told. we've got loads of questions that have come in so I've tried to star some of the most uh, I think um, important ones the ones that are the favorites that, that people are uh, voting on so let me have a look right Andre here pest control has always been about customer service which by nature is convenient to the customer access etc so I am I correct in thinking if you are not online or Facebook things like that you are not going to survive 
I think it's a really good question. And what I would say is you might survive, but will you thrive? Um, <laughs> to use that crass cliche comment. Um, what you have to remember, as I say, is that these more and more where people go to look for these kinds of things is online. People Google these things, they search on Facebook. Um, and so for me, I would certainly recommend that it is a really good idea to get yourself on social media with a free page um, through Facebook, um, get yourself set up with a website, even if again, that's a free website, um, you can do things um, you know, quite, again, quite cheaply and easily these days. And I think that visibility uh, is really important there, yes. Um, so whilst um, a lot is based on local reputation and historically has been for these kind of services, um, I think as we move forward, yes, I would definitely say uh, get yourself online. Fab. How long do you think um, it's, it's been important to get yourself online? You know, obviously we've had it, we've had the internet, we've had you know uh, social media for quite a while. But how how yeah, obviously there's not an exact number. But in your opinion, how long? Well, I think the thing that you need to think about there is who are your consumers and who is your um, target market. Now it used to be the case when the kind of social media first had its big boom um, that it was it was kind of just a thing for teenagers, um, youngsters. And so being there wasn't important. Now, everyone's on Facebook, you know, um, people's nans are on Facebook. And also the people who first joined these platforms when they first started out are now becoming homeowners themselves and are now needing to access these services themselves. Mm. So I think it's got continuing, increasing importance um, to, to kind of get yourself online in this day and age. Good stuff. Great answer. Um, so Martin Cobbold here says, how much do you think that audio search will affect consumer behaviour in the future? Will people just say, Alexa, find me a pest controller? Other platforms Ooh. available, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what? That's actually not something that I've thought about. And I, I think that that is a really good question and probably something um, that we do need to think about. Um, and so from that perspective, if you if you were to ask Alexa or other service providers, um, the way that they would do that would be ranking it through, again, providing you with the top ranked. So that's where you want to think about being top ranked in on things like Google um, and um on things like your social media apps and in those big areas. So again, demonstrates the importance of having, getting yourself online, getting constantly updating your content as well. Remembering that if you've got a web page, it isn't enough to just have a static web page. You want to be adding to it, updating it. Mm. Um, and that is is feeding your your site out into the algorithms in a way that they're very very happy to munch up and that's more likely um to to feed them back to people searching but yeah great point yeah good point I mean, maybe it needs to be alexa find me a bpca member that would have been better wouldn't it Absolutely. You know, think, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff we've still got a couple of minutes left so let's do a few more um so from graham here is google in a position of market dominance so that they can become the super uber using Google reviews and advertising fees to filter who they choose to present as a supplier? Uh, yes, they are. Um, because the, the power that Google has is uh, is astronomical. <laughs> um, the I, I suppose the issue there is, what we have to remember always is that Google is out to benefit Google, right? Um, so they are always looking um, to to be the most convenient themselves. That's what they want. They want to be the most trusted. They want to be the most convenient. And so to a certain extent, they it is to their benefit that they keep finding new sources um, and, and the best and, as I say, most up-to-date uh, sites, providers, etc., rather than than kind of keeping that closed off mm. because they'll be aware that otherwise um people will no longer use google they'll move to other search engines so yes they have the power but they also understand what they have to provide and how to use it absolutely fantastic i'm gonna get am i allowed another question scott yeah he, he's gonna let me have one more <laughs> so, <laughs> um so last question then is pest control now going to be all down to it skills 
Yeah, really, really good question. And uh, I understand this a lot, especially when, you know, you, you've, as I say, you're experts in pest control, right? Unfortunately, yes, there is a part of it where you have to understand that the marketing um, is, is moving into much more technological areas. And again, that comes back to this convenience culture. Mm. Now, what you have to do there is think about how are you pairing up with uh, your, your expertise, your skills, your knowledge, your history, um, and cre using all of that to help create that IT based content for you. Mm -hmm. So thinking about, you know, okay, actually, if I were to run a blog, I've got loads of experience that I can use in terms of blogging. If I were to run, for example, an Instagram account, right, I can take photos on my job, you know, on my phone mm -hmm. of the la latest pest that I've been wrangling with or the latest control measures that I've been putting in. So I think, yes, it is inevitable that some technological skills are going to have to be utilized in order to keep up with this. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's important that if you do have a website or if you do have a social media presence, then that isn't just static and, you know, was last updated five years ago. Because in a way, that's even worse, because then if people visit that, even worse than not having one, because if people visit that, they'll think that you've gone out of business. Yeah, I've if certainly it's done the same, yes. Yeah. Insights and thought, I'm going to click off of that. I don't like the look of exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. So I think it is about not thinking that you have to be a tech expert, looking for the most convenient answers for yourself. So the most convenient social media platforms to use, the most convenient um, website creators to use, um, that are you know, very formulaic and easy to work with. And then using your expertise to populate that site. So you're merging your, your tech skills or the tech skills of someone else, of course, mm -hmm. with actually what is your expertise and how can you show that off and using the tech platforms to share that. Fantastic. We're getting some great comments in the discussion forum about how, you know, brilliant your discussion, your, your presentation was and yeah, lots of answers given there to the question. So thank you, Poppy. That was really, really great. Thank you. Um, thank you and have that. a fabulous evening. Um, excellent thank you thank so much you. Um, just a quick reminder to the attendees here um that's the the last of the technical theater seminar today We've still got a few more going on but the event doesn't close till eight o'clock so why not have a look around um some the exhibition hall as i said it's open till 8 p.m so we've got a happy hour on the scavenger hunt most important thing so for this last hour here you're gonna get bonus points for um for yeah visiting the exhibitor stand interacting with them ask some questions click on that chat now video calls why not they're there waiting for you so please do that have a look around as i said you've got no traffic to worry about have you so um none of that none of that london horrible traffic so great get out there get some points and we will see you tomorrow hopefully take care everybody